Welcome to this week's Local Matters. I'm Elizabeth. Let's get started. Starting in the late 1930s, the outer Cape Cod has attracted some of the prime movers of modern architecture, including architects, engineers, artists, writers, and other academics. On Monday, June 7th, from 7 to 8 p.m., join the Plymouth Public Library for a virtual lecture about mid-century modern houses built on the outer Cape in the 1950s and 60s. The presenter will be Cape Cod Modern House Trust tour guide and events manager, Betsy Bray. Betsy has taught courses on these little known houses nestled in the woods of Wellfleet and Truro for the Open University of Wellfleet, the Snow and Eldridge Libraries, and UMass Boston. To register, visit the library's website. Pauline Kieser is the president of the Aldrin Kindred of America, Inc., and visited with Julie via Zoom to talk about this historical site located in Duxbury. Pauline Kieser, welcome so much. You are the president of the Alden Kindred of America. Could you let our viewers know exactly what this is, this organization? Certainly, and thank you for having me here this morning. The Alden Kindred of America was formed early in 1906 uh, and to own and protect the Alden land in Duxbury, Mass., which included a house and next door on the uh, first site on the high school property. It is today a National Historic Landmark, is run by the Alden Kindred of America. We have people that belong to the Alden Kindred because they have the lineage descendants, descendancy, but we also have people belong just because they want to support the organization as well. So today we sit in Duxbury on five acres. It was two and a half, five years ago. We expanded the place and bought the land next door that was originally ours anyway, so that we now can expand the facility. We uh, keep generations of uh, lineage for our members. We uh, serve the community. We have education programs for the Dutch Bay schools for years and years for third and fifth graders and high schoolers do internships there. And uh, we open to the public in the summer months for uh, visitors and we have programs kind of year round, but inside the facility is very, really small. Okay, great. So um, that's what we are. Okay, question. For anyone who doesn't know, of the story of John and Priscilla Alden are, is pretty um, miraculous and amazing. Can you just briefly give that synopsis? <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting because it was made famous by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the poet who wrote The Courtship of Miles Standish. And supposedly, you know, Phil, Priscilla came over as a child. She was 16 on that, on that trip over. And John was not a pilgrim, but he was the cooper hired onto the ship. And they landed, of course, they lost half the people the first year in a pandemic. And um, people were looking around to grow the colony. And Miles Standage had lost his wife. And you know there weren't too many eligible women. There were only four women left in the colony. And at that time, Priscilla was 17, so she wasn't considered a woman. So long story short, um, you know, uh, Miles Standish's sidekick was John Alden. He was very good with his hands and wooden stuff. He did everything for him. So he sent him to do his bidding. And supposedly, the spunky lady, Priscilla Mullins, put her hands on her hips after a long, odd conversation, awkward, and said, speak for thyself, John. Well, we've taken that speak for thyself, John, as a, a real tagline to the Alden Kindred story, because there was Priscilla speaking, speaking for herself and asking him to do the same. And they uh, married a couple of years later and had 10 children. They have thousands and thousands and thousands of descendants. And the people on that Mayflower, 10% of the population is in some way directly related to everybody on that ship. It's pretty amazing. And they produce presidents, nine presidents. We have three. So um, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. It deserves to be told, it deserves to be understood, and it deserves to be celebrated. Right, and historically, um, over the last probably 10 to 20 years, people have been more and more interested in their lineage and in their in, in their history of, of their families. Now you're saying that 10%? That, no, that's true because of Ancestry.com and the, and, the, and the types of, uh, uh, what the computers have allowed us to do to find out. That's why this whole burst of interest in roots I think it's deeper than that though. People are interested in their roots because they're, they're looking for what, how their past 
uh, it becomes their future. I think there's a, a, a big sense of belonging, a sense of uh, finding people's roots. I, I'm at the Alden Kinder sometimes in the summer and you know, people in one day will come from Denmark and California and Texas. I'm like, whoa, how'd you find us? They came because they wanted to see the house. Right. I think they were now, let's, let's talk a little yeah, bit. Cool. Yeah, let's talk about the property itself, and, and it, it's almost like a living museum. And what are the what? How is it now? And what are your plans for the future? Uh, well, originally the tract of land was based on the Mayflower Compact, and Priscilla owned her shares, and so did um, uh, Alden. So together they had uh, about a hundred acres. Now we sit on uh, two and a half acres uh, four years ago until we picked up the two and a half acre piece next to it. And so now we have five acres and we got to look at our property differently. We have the Alden house sitting on there. We have a barn that was constructed in the 1990s, which provides a small meeting place for about 25 to 30 and a, um, a, a set of couple of offices underneath. It's far too small for what we want to do. Even the third graders that come over from Duxbury, uh, and, you know, they come over in groups of 90 children. It's, it's pretty overwhelming. You have to split them all up. So uh, one of the things we need to do is we need more space. Secondly, we need to tell the story a different way. I think this past year taught us a lot of lessons. We did so many virtual programs. Now we have people all over the world listening to us, hearing us, wanting to come, wanting to experience what they could, could do if they came virtually. And that is the whole idea of the Living History Center. We want to add on to the barn uh, a two-story um, barn-like looking place that would have uh, the ability to do that. It, it will be a smart building. Today's museums are very interactive, very technical, and very interesting, and people love them. The ones a lot of people haven't seen this yet. And this in a small place, we do that in a small way to make a big story and to send it around the world. So that if you were hearth cooking here, people could join us at their home and so, and, and emulate what was going on at the Alden House. Yeah, that's so that's wonderful. a piece of it. Yeah, yeah it, it's. It, we, we found that during the pandemic, so many um, historical sites and museums and the, the like have have gone to virtual programs and probably have a lot more eyes on them that they than they otherwise would have if they hadn't. Do you agree with that? Well, we get we get probably two three hundred for a lecture. Now we couldn't do that in person. However, the new space will allow us to have up to maybe seventy five people, which is a nice nice size venue. It can be used by the community. It could be used by us. It could be used by other families. The Delano family, for instance, has uh, grew up next to the Alden, has said, geez, we don't have a place to meet. You know, that's perfect. That's perfect to do those things. So uh, the other thing we have to do is to protect this place. We have, uh, you know, anything to be restored in a, a fashion of, you know, three, four hundred years ago is not an easy task. It's an expensive task. And almost every funding source now requires about a hundred percent match. So it's imperative that part of this uh, Alden building campaign we're doing is the building, but part of it is to set aside a fund specifically for preservation of those assets. It's, it's a big job. And we also have the first site, which we sits on public land, but we own the site. So that's next door in the back of the lacrosse field. And we're constantly, you know, worried about what's going to happen to that. And we, ha we have it designated, but it needs to be designated in a better way. And we're working with the town on that. And what will happen when this uh, Living History Center comes to life um, is that our program, program, programming will be year round. It, can, it doesn't have to stop, which means that we are going to be a larger organization will cost more to run it. So the third leg of the stool, besides the first two, one was the preservation fund, one was the living history museum, is to build that endowment in order to run a larger organization. It's a well thought out plan. We've spent five years talking and doing about it. We're hoping that people in the Plymouth area realize the significance of this and will help us. We need everybody's help. If everybody helps a little bit, We'll make it. The total is 2.3 million. Sounds like a big number to me, but it's going to happen in small and mid-sized gifts, I think. And um, 
we yeah. welcome them. We welcome your viewers to go online and see us at Alden.org and take a look. So people can go there for all the information. And there's a lot of uh, videos I noticed on your website. There's a lot of information. So anyone who wants to know anything about the Alden um, House or the Alden Kinship can certainly do so. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, you're very welcome. It's nice to be here. And we produced a film this year about the history of the house that we'll use in this new center and before. Uh, and it was done um, by all of us. You know, it was just done with uh, with love and some talent of some certain board members. And uh, I invite you to take a look at that online. And I invite air, all your listeners to uh, pay attention to what we're doing. It really makes a difference. It, it will help us preserve our history and to celebrate it and to make the Alden House and, and its designation as a national historic landmark, the only one in Duxbury, stand out. Okay. Thank you. I and that is the like last word. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pauline, for joining us today and best of luck with this whole project. Thank you. Come visit us. Thank you, Julie. To learn more, visit www.alden.org. The LGBT Aging Project, together with the Duxbury Senior Center, invite you to a June 17th LGBTQ lawn party at the Senior Center. From 4 to 5.30 p.m., play bocce, lawn games, enjoy food, and great company at this first in-person event since last year. To register, email programs at DuxburyCOA.com. If you've always wanted to try your hand at painting but were unsure about how to begin, the Kingston Public Library has the perfect class just for you. Certified art instructor Melissa Kowal will guide you through a beginning level art class for adults using a beautiful rural red barn as the inspiration. The class takes place on June 14th at 6 p.m. It's free and supplies will be provided. Try something new and register via the Kingston Public Library website. Heritage Museums and Gardens, just down Route 3 in Sandwich, is a nationally significant public garden with a working Charles Louvre carousel made in 1908, a world-class collection of American automobiles and American folk art. It is definitely worth a trip, and its 2021 annual auto show is a great opportunity. This year's family-friendly event takes place on Saturday, June 12th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and highlights antique and classic automobiles, hot rods, custom cars, and motorcycles in excellent original or restored condition. All body styles are invited and displayed on the lawns and fields at Heritage, where registered vehicles can compete for awards. Special guests this year are the Cape Cod chapter of the early Ford V8 Club. It was the Ford V8's affordability and reliability that helped to advance American automobile travel. To learn more and register, visit heritagemuseumsandgardens.org slash autoshow. From green energy to green living, your green space features ways you can keep your garden, home, and body feeling green. Here's a teaser for episode three. Labors of love take time and we've been following the growth journey of the blueberry bushes here at Maribet Farms for almost six months. Last time we visited, these bushes were just coming out of hibernation from the harsh winter, and Ron walked us through a good winter pruning. Now that spring is here, we are going to observe how that first pruning session has helped produce buds and started sugar production. Let's go see how far these plants have come. Welcome to the Maribet Farm. This is the second in a series of pruning demonstrations. Uh, the first one was in, in the winter time. Uh, for people who want to know when you should be pruning, the answer is if you have a large plantation like this, it's any time you can. <laughs> Try to start in the winter and then come back and finish in the springtime before the blossom. Okay, and that comes up in May. So we're gonna have uh, a guest in this video. It's a student from Bridgewater State University, Jenna Lynn Warkup. 
I feel like everything is pretty interconnected and that I can learn many lessons from a plant in, to apply in my own human life. And she's uh, an a Adrian Tinsley Summer Grant awardee. And she's working here with the farm, which is gonna have a weather station installed, which you'll be able to monitor at some point. And um, she's working on the relationship between climate change and farming and crops. So welcome, thank you very much, and we'll get right to work. Here's the, uh, here's the bush that we were working on. We did winter pruning, and one of, the, one of the caveats that make winter pruning difficult is that you have changes in temperature, which are occurring a lot more now, and so you'll get a warm spell, and the plant will grow. Let's see that dead little stem. And then we'll get a cold frost, and that little stem will die off. Scientists say that it's good to have a leader is because they are closer to the sun and uh, blueberries are a water pump. In other words, they exert a pressure on the groundwater and because of the power of the sun, the solar beam, and they start to pull the water up. So you want a leader that's out there early and often pulling it up because it's, it's getting all these other ones on the way up. The energy goes from the leaf up the stem. It doesn't come, it doesn't, if it comes up this stem here, right? It's not gonna go, oh, I don't see any fruit up here. Let me go back down and go up and find, it doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's one way. <laughs> it flo flows up into the fruit or trends evaporates depending on the weather conditions. So if you see a stem that's got nothing on the end of it, and a lot of leaves, you can say, oh, I should leave that because that's going to produce a lot of sugar. What's it going to produce it into? Mm -hmm. Nothing. It's just going to keep taking energy away from the other leaves around the plant. I don't, you can see I don't have to top anything off here. This is the elevation we want, six or, six or seven feet. Or maybe some between, between five and seven feet is a good elevation for the blueberry plant. Um, that's what it's designed. These are hybrid cultivated, cultivated blueberries and they're designed for you know, an energy cycle that stays within that. They get bigger, they, uh, they start to disperse the energy, diffuse it more. Growing and cultivating blueberries have so many benefits and returns, from the delicious fruit itself to producing fresh air and generating physical activity, all while bonding with nature. These properly pruned bushes now have the best chance for healthy growth. We'll let the sunshine and soil do their work and check back in with Ron for the final stages of the berries growing cycle, the harvest. I'm Erica and this is your green space. Stay tuned. To see the entire episode, visit our YouTube page at The Local Scene and visit the Your Green Space playlist. Fresh off the farm, here's Erica again with an all new In the Schools. It feels like 2021 is on a fast track as we're already into graduation season. PAC TV will be live streaming both Silver Lake Regional High School and Pembroke High School's graduation starting tonight. Silver Lake Regional High School's graduation is tonight, June 4th. The ceremony began at 6 p.m. and was held at Sirico Fields with a rain date of June 5th at 6 p.m. If you missed it, you can catch it on Laker TV's YouTube channel. Pembroke High School's graduation is tomorrow, Saturday, June 5th. The ceremony begins at 10 a.m. and will be held on the high school field with a rain date to be determined. You can watch on Comcast 14 and in Pembroke or on Titan TV's YouTube. Earlier this week, graduates of both schools in their caps and gowns took their last walk as seniors were able to visit schools throughout each district, traveling through the corridors being celebrated by their former teachers and K-8 students. This year, students may have gone throughout the schools differently, but students and staff were able to share this special moment together. Congratulations to the class of 2021. Have you planned your summer beach reads yet? Get stocked up and help your library at the Pembroke Public Library's annual Friends Outdoor Book Sale. It takes place on the front lawn from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Saturday, June 12th, and is a chance to see friends you've been missing, help your library, and buy local. Visit the library's website to learn more. 
Susan Hunter is a local poet and former newspaper editor whose poems have been published in several journals. Currently a freelance journalist, Susan was a winner of the recent Plymouth Poetry Contest, organized by Plymouth Poet Laureate Stephen Delbos. This is her original work. Hello, I'm Susan Hunter. I hope you enjoy these poems. End of story during a pandemic. The endings are not on the page. They tell of the last conversation, kindnesses, gin and tonics in a cabin, Casablanca on a rainy Cambridge night. I've searched for my great grandfather who may have died on a ship or may have married someone else, may have been a cleric with a choke collar cradling his handsome face, may have loved my great grandmother and taken all her money. Small waves lapped around their ankles as they ran across a sea of mussel shells. Sunlight sparkled on the water before reaching its resting place on the opposite shore. How's that for an ending? How else do you say it ended if not with a broken heart? Son, how many times will you rise before this is over? You top the neighbor's house as she walks her dogs gingerly in frosty grass. She holds the leashes like flounces of a ball gown. Searching for Emily Dickinson. Emily Dickinson closed doors, slammed them, turned the lock. She kept inside as she opened words like doors, sliced them open like tin cans, splashing out pain of a meadow aching with dandelions. Words in slanted scrawl like skeins of wool hidden in shut desk drawers, scratched out on scraps on gilded stationery. Emily Dickinson died after crafting an eternity of deaths, syllables whirling in eddies like needles poking through her unlived centuries. I search for that phrase pulled back through the eye to a green grassy space a candle in a midnight room. Photograph on a foggy winter afternoon. How the sun comes in from the left in shafts. How it sits on the leaves that have wintered on that tree. How it lights up the mist to white but doesn't reach the dark forest floor. How we know this is an interlude between ice and ice that the ghost will return, sharpening and sharpening into focus on the summer hillside. This is a poem I wrote during a trip to Spain a few years ago. Hopefully we can all travel again soon. Seville Sunday. The call of the dove fills space between church bell chime and trellis climbing up the walls of our tiny patio. Only a square of sky blue sends down the hottest air. In triple coup, the bird asks, where have you gone? Where are you going? Where are you? In more frantic tremolo, its call echoes down the years, the centuries, through the gardens of the Alcazar and the warm fountains, making a beeline to the Azores and across the ocean in mist, time traveler. It resounds in my grandmother's dining room. Listen, she said to me, it's the morning dove. It was the owl hooting in the woods to the little girl lost and far from home, or that Eurasian dove call moving across the snow tops east of the Alhambra to fall on the cupped ears, thirsty and far below. These two poems are ones that I've had published. On viewing child Hassam, we all looked at the beautiful pictures painted in a time before we were born, in a century before the last one, before the horrors of just yesterday and the day before. And we drank in the colors of the roses whose petals had fallen on the table. A woman looked into a mirror beside an open window. The sunlight poured into the room filled with daffodils. It was morning and a young woman was reading on a settee. She was wearing a dress and stockings. Why not? 
It was a beautiful world, this world of the painting. It was the world that preceded our childhoods or the childhoods we never had. In the painting where the sun didn't shine, there was the shimmering of wet city pavement. Mothers took children by the hand and led them to a warm and comfortable place. The city had a clear view of blue sky down to the harbor. In the world of the heart, when a grassy lawn leads up to a clappered house, it means the ocean is a stone's throw away. Lunch is almost ready and the aroma of lilies and lilacs overwhelms the senses. We don't need to strain the ear to make out the music. A woman in lace plays the piano while her sister sits nearby. Softly close the door so as not to disturb the slow cadence of the passing years. Door. Door, I'd come in and out, and in and out with lilacs in my hands, angry over her, over him, over her and over him. Door, I came through after ice and snow. Door, she bolted to keep us out. Door, I ran out of to do what I loved. Door, my daughter slammed. Door, the ghost came through with housewarming embrace. Door closed after I had left. Sound of shutting, of breaking heart apart. Thank you so much, Susan. And thank you for staying with us for this episode of Local Matters. From all of us at PAC TV, have a happy and safe week. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to The Local Scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.